there's a pretty clear line in the sand marking the different eras of Ratchet & Clank. You've got the PS2 era, with its cruder humor and its heavy 1950s or 60s sci-fi visual inspirations. The PS3's Future Saga's slightly matured art style and attempt at a deeper, more sweeping narrative, and then 2010 hits, and things get a little weird. After the series in many folks' eyes had peaked with a crack in time just a year prior, there was now this uncertainty regarding whether Ratchet & Clank was done, or what was going to happen next. At least, to fans. Although developer Insomniac Games kept suggesting publicly before a crack in time's October 2009 release that it might be the final Ratchet game, back in January, only a few months after that game began production, work separately began on what would become a Ratchet & Clank spin-off, based on ideas the studio had been floating as far back as 2004. In spring just a few months later, a Ratchet & Clank action figure line was announced in partnership with comic giant DC, and by 2010, DC was working to publish a proper Ratchet & Clank comic. The series clearly wasn't going anywhere, but nevertheless, we all took the bait. What followed was a tumultuous few years to say the least, both for the Ratchet series and its developer, as budgets shrank, as games got smaller and more experimental, as critic scores and sales dipped, and as fans complained about a different art style, of all things. Ratchet & Clank's luster, maybe, had faded as we entered the spin-off era. However, I think the context surrounding these games is incredibly important and, as always, it's wildly glossed over. I think now, with more time removed since their releases, it's time to revisit what tends to be considered a major misstep by core fans, and games that most everybody else probably doesn't even remember exist. These are the blunder years of Ratchet & Clank. Or are they? Oh, you've got to be funny. Two thousand ten wasn't just a breakpoint for the Ratchet series; it was also a breakpoint for Insomniac Games, or perhaps rather a breaking point. I've detailed throughout my earlier RNC retrospectives how increasingly close to the brink of failure the studio had come with each and every game, but a crack in time's absurdly rushed nine-month production cycle changed things. As a quick refresher for those of you too weak to watch eight hours of my videos in one single sitting, as early as 2002, just after the first Ratchet & Clank's release, Insomniac began conceptualizing another game franchise, a return to the first-person shooter genre, with proper pre-production of this FPS beginning around the end of 2003. This would become one of the PS3's biggest launch titles, Resistance Fall of Man, likely the first game to enter production for the new console, being developed before they had the specs for the actual system itself. When this game was conceived, Insomniac had around 40 people on staff. Three years later, when it was born, that number was 160. Imagine the stretch marks. Now, you might be wondering why I'm bringing up Resistance in a Ratchet & Clank video, to which I will respond, Hello, welcome to the Golden Bolt, where we go deeper than anybody else really needs to. Please subscribe or else YouTube hits me. The reason is that the fates of both these series are so deeply intertwined that you cannot untangle the knots. Initially, the idea was that Insomniac would alternate between the two series, one releasing on even years, the other on odd. This would help avoid series fatigue, it would give the team time to refresh and experiment, and it would hopefully cut down on the crunch and employee burnout the studio had run into during the PS2 era. All noble ideas, except that's not what happened. While Resistance 1 was finishing production, the first PS3 Ratchet title, codenamed RNC Future, was in pre-production, with a small squad rebuilding everything from the PS2 games from scratch. Considering this game's eventual name, Tools of Destruction, was a poke at how frustrating this retooling process became, let's just say it wasn't a very smooth transition. After crunching to finish Resistance, most of Insomniac jumped over to Ratchet & Clank to push it into full production for the following year, leaving behind a small crew to work on improving the development tools in order to make Resistance 2 easier to make. The studio, however, due to struggles with hiring and onboarding for both these past two years and several years afterwards, then had to crunch to finish Ratchet by fall 2007 before jumping onto Resistance 2, with yet again a small team staying behind to begin pre-production on the studio's 2009 Ratchet game, A Crack in Time. Except that's not what happened. 
See, according to the series' longtime creative director Brian Allgaier, the studio had initially pitched, or in his words, promised Sony that Tools of Destruction would have some sort of co-op mode and or online multiplayer, which Insomniac quickly realized wasn't going to happen with the rest of the game's scope. The studio then made a deal with the publisher to instead produce a bite-sized downloadable PSN game, a Ratchet & Clank Future 1.5 if you will, that would release as Quest for Booty in August 2008. This would steal about half a year away from a Kraken Times pre-production. I'm a little teapot. But once it was finished, the team had ample time to prepare for full development. Except again, you guessed it, that's not what happened, because the Ratchet team was immediately pulled to help finish Resistance 2, which was running behind schedule and wasn't going to make its November release date without all hands on deck. So for a few months, A Crack in Time only had three people working on it, before essentially the entire rest of the studio finished crunching on Resistance 2 to immediately start a 9-10 to 10 month non-stop crunch on Ratchet and & Clank, and then after A Crack in Time came out in October 2009, the team had another year of crunch ahead if Resistance 3 was going to come out in 2010 as planned. Except, thankfully this time, that's not what happened. With all of this perennial pressure dating as far back as Crunch on Ratchet & Clank 2, something had to give. By all indications, Insomniac had been making genuine efforts to improve its pipelines and strategies with every release, but some, pardon the pun, wrench kept getting thrown into the mix and making it all worse. But unlike in the PS2 days where you could fake it until you make it, this new hardware required a higher level of technical and visual spectacle. People expected more, and that usually takes more people and more time. A rapid one-year turnaround wasn't gonna cut it anymore, and also unlike the PS2 days, this team wasn't mostly a bunch of early 20-something dudes right out of college anymore. These folks had families, kids. Priorities start to change a bit, and no matter how fun a workplace is, folks aren't as willing to stick around without a good work-life balance. With the studio's likely very tired and very over-caffeinated staff in mind, Insomniac and Sony agreed to delay Resistance 3 by a year before it had even been announced. All the while, though, Insomniac was still making moves. Back in 2008, it unveiled plans to open a second studio across the country from its Burbank, California home. I'd speculate that it's no coincidence that this second location in Durham, North Carolina is infinitely more affordable for folks that are looking to start a family, or just live. It, in general. This is where the timeline starts to get a little fuzzy, and where Ratchet starts to get less fuzzy. We opened up the studio here in January of 2009. And we've been working on All for One since, since that very day. Uh, we knew that we wanted to make a Ratchet title that was all about cooperative play even back then. But some of the earliest discussions le that led to All for One were talking about getting Ratchet and Clank on the screen as playable characters at the same time. This small offshoot team started at just around 10 folks, quietly chipping away at building the base for a new Ratchet and Clank title at the very same time that A Crack in Time was being produced. Not just that, it was the antithesis to A Crack in Time, which had our heroes acting mostly independently from one another. Instead, this new project aimed to put our dynamic duo on screen at the same time as equals, rather than having separate sections for Shooty McFuzzboy and Backpack Who Controls Other Robots with 5G and is also now a Time Lord. This co-op mindset, in addition to being a popular fan request, took a not insignificant amount of inspiration from a huge family-friendly co-op game that had been released just a few months before in 2008, Little Big Planet. The family-friendly part of that is a bit important, considering that once this game moved from its original two-player concept to a four-player co-op game co-starring Captain Quark and Dr. Nefarious, the early working titles included foreplay and multiple organisms. That second one apparently might have been the fastest no that the studio ever received for a name idea, which is saying a lot for this series. I haven't found a concrete answer as to exactly when Ratchet & Clank All For One was formally pitched to Sony or greenlit. Some folks seem to indicate after a Crack in Time released, so as far as the Crack in Time team was concerned, their project may likely have been the end of the series as they were saying and as they were heavily pushing during marketing. This also means that All For One would have to pick up the pieces of a Crack in Time's already written ending, or it would have to go off and do its own thing. It kind of did both. Following the initial plan of alternating releases every other year, All For One was developed around a 2011 release plan, which meant that this game had one of the longest development cycles of not just Ratchet, but of any Insomniac game, a trend that thankfully for the studio's well-being would continue in the years to come. If you don't count the next Ratchet game, or the next one, 
or the next one after that. There was but one hiccup with this plan. As an explicitly different game that looked to shift back into the isolated annual adventures of the PS2 era and move away from Future's multi-game story arc that, frankly, hadn't exactly lit up the sales charts maybe as much as the team hoped, All For One would not be able to address many facets of a Crack in Time's plot. For example, it would be tough for a simple co-op game to properly address Ratchet watching his mentor die. It would be tougher to explain why Nefarious is Player 4, considering that he was 100% intended to die forever when the previous game shot him into a space station. In comes the Ratchet & Clank comic, a six-issue run written by Insomniac's TJ Fixman and published by DC between September 2010 and February 2011. Yeah, despite Insomniac's rare year off from actually releasing games, 2010 might have been their busiest year for announcements. Between these comics, All for One and Resistance 3 being announced just a month afterwards, the studio's announcement in May that they'd be going multi-platform in a partnership with EA... Well, three out of four ain't bad. This comic run provided Fixman a bunch of super fun opportunities, many that simply hadn't been possible within the confines of game development, let alone rushed game development. As far back as 2007, he had expressed his desire to bring back fan-favorite PS2 characters like the Q-Force, and now that those characters just had to be drawn and not extensively modeled, voiced, and animated, his only budget was page count. Not to mention that taking an extra year in between games allowed for some fun time skip opportunities, such as telling a story about our bumbling idiot celebrity Captain Quark becoming pre <laughs> becoming president. <laughs> oh, only in fiction. What? I didn't vote for the guy. The comic focuses around President Quark's series-wide tendency to somehow create most of the universe's problems through sheer incompetence. This time around, he caused a successful career bureaucrat by the name of Artemis Zog to snap when, instead of endorsing Zog's presidential campaign at a press conference, Quark felt the fame bug itching and announced that he would run for president too. And then, after he won, despite Zog still working under him for the betterment of the galaxy, Quark cancelled Zog's entire life work, a secret program called Project Helios that would save planets at risk of destruction from things like supernovas by warping those planets somewhere else using interdimensional rifts. A noble project, but for once Quark maybe had the right idea by realizing after the events of the future saga that dimensional travel maybe wouldn't go too well. Good idea or not, this veto sent Zog spiraling and led to his sudden disappearance. Which brings us to our once again retired duo, Ratchet and Clank. After years of constant galaxy saving and dealing with the aftermath of the events of a crack in time, coming so close to seeing his family, seeing his species for the very first time shut up, watching his mentor die, Ratchet just up and left the Polaris galaxy, leaving behind the press, his friends, and even his girlfriend on a whim, returning to his quiet garage on planet Velden. At least until their retirement is, as always, broken up, in this case when the planet is warped from its usual orbit into Zog's brand new Frankenstein galaxy, made up of stolen planets from throughout the past games. This short 120 or so pages of comic is just a total love letter to the series, with references to just about every prior Ratchet game. I mean, for one, the plot of Planets Getting Stolen was actually the original concept tossed around for a crack in time before it was decided that maybe that didn't mesh too well with the time travel ideas. But again, in a comic, there's no worrying about silly details like feasibility or animation budgets. The only limitation is your mind. That's why the comics mark the return of the Solana Galaxy's Galactic Rangers and Ratchet's ex-girlfriend Sasha, as well as her dad, this galaxy's president, who I'm legally required to remind you is a half-robot, half-furry Bill Clinton. And in classic PS2 Ratchet fashion, the villain makes the tried-and-true mistake of specifically going after Ratchet's homeworld out of spite, which is, it's like invading Russia in winter, you just don't do it, Ratchet's spite will always win out. It's not just the old games that get this sort of love, though, as Ratchet has a steamy prison encounter with one of the Agorians he fought in the only level you remember from A Crack in Time, and again, the entire plot is based around the fallout of the Future Saga. Hell, it's even a love letter to Ratchet games that weren't even conceptualized yet. The core of the Helios program are these crystals, which, when positively charged, allow you to effectively teleport yourself or even a planet, but when negatively charged, will tear open rifts between different dimensions. These comics came out over a decade before Rift Apart featured crystals with these very same properties as the entire gameplay gimmick, as the explanation for how the Dimensionator even existed in the first place. I'm not going to give you a whole play-by-play -play for the comic, but my favorite bit about it is that Fixman tries to make up a bit for lost time by tackling the dropped threads of the Future Saga, threads that I do want to remind you were likely written before he took over as writer. 
where Tools of Destruction, and especially A Crack in Time, dealt with questions about Ratchet and Clank's respective fathers, their origins, one of the crucial bits of Tools' story ended up on the cutting room floor due to that game just kind of getting too bloated narratively. And that is Ratchet's girlfriend Talwin, and her questions about her father, the one who kind of kicked off the whole saga despite never actually being featured in the games. In fact, our villain Zog is from the same species as Talwin. He has a past connection to her father Max. He's her analog to Azimuth for Ratchet and Orvis for Clank. And Zog uses that connection at points to twist the knife. Without Max Apogee studying the Lombax's disappearance, Zog would never have found these dimension warping crystals. Even though Talwin naturally doesn't get full closure because she just can't have nice things, it's a really fun little wrinkle that I'm glad got explored somewhere, a way to complete our Triforce of Daddy issues, covering wisdom, courage, and getting limited screen time. Fun fact, by the way, you may not know this, but those were actually the original names for the three pieces of Zelda's Triforce too. Don't Google it. It's genuinely impressive how much these issues, each under 25 pages, cram in to help address Ratchet's post-crack in time trauma, his and Clank's, admittedly mostly his, desire to just retire at this point. It's such a great narrative tie to close out one era of Ratchet and open up another. F for like two years until they went back to this era and closed it again. But wh whatever, it's thanks to these six issues names that we also know so many of All For One's early planned titles. Bros Before Foes, Friends With Benefits, plus a totally unrelated one that's just great, Ears of War. If you haven't read the Ratchet & Clank comics, I really do recommend it. It's such a good time and it shows glimpses of what a longer form Ratchet story could look like. You know, like a show or a movie. Now admittedly and understandably, the comics don't really get much acknowledgement in All For One since All For One's disc install cinematic covers Quark being president and elaborates more than the comics in passing mention about Nefarious' escape from certain doom. So relax, kick back, and put your faith in myself and Vice President Scrunch. All For One opens up with our duo once again coming out of semi-retirement to escort the President to receive the Intergalactic Tool of Justice Award, which naturally is a trap set up by Nefarious. However, this is still Nefarious we're talking about. Dude went kinda cuckoo years ago after Ratchet & Clank first beat him, so his plans now leave a bit to be desired. This is the setup to put our three, uh, two and a half heroes and their arch nemesis together, as they're forced to team up to take down this giant light-eating Zagroot before it demolishes this bioluminescent city. Well, wait, is it really truly bioluminescent when the city's powered by the entrapment and exploitation of weird electric creatures? I don't know, folks like to say that the later Ratchet games lost their prodding and hypercapitalism, but I don't know, between this and the battery bots, it's still kinda there. Putting aside how wrong some of you were about that, this introductory level is a great showcase of the potential for the all-for-one concept. The single-screen co-op focus naturally forced a complete rethink of how Ratchet gameplay would look, first and foremost taking the four playable characters and exaggerating their proportions a little bit so that they'd be easily identifiable on screen, but really more so thanks to the heavier-than-ever emphasis on the locales that our heroes visit. This game is packed absolutely full of gorgeous scenery shots thanks to the new locked camera angles. There is a surprisingly high level of environmental detail given that it's a 720p game, and with remarkably few hiccups, all four players will never really run into issues sharing the screen or getting left behind. Moreover, despite the game taking place almost exclusively on one planet, the variety of the game's nine major missions masks that by never letting up. If you're wondering why All For One cuts out a major Ratchet staple, the variety of planets to fly to and explore, it's both a core requirement for the plot, since Nefarious would just escape the moment he found a way to leave the other three behind, as seen when he does exactly that, and it's also very possibly another one of Insomniac's trademark cut concepts that ended up repurposed later down the road. An early story pitch for what would later become Ratchet Deadlocked was a game called Ratchet & Clank Nexus, which would trap our duo on one single planet for the duration of the game, a way of subverting the usual expectation of spacefaring adventures and giving players more of a direct connection to one world in particular. After all, if you really think about it, most of the planets we travel to throughout the series end up being surprisingly one note, in the same way that planets in Star Wars almost invariably feature only one biome or theme, whether it's planet-wide city, desert, swamp, whatever. Actually, the first level in this game is one of the rare times that we see two distinct sides to a planet, as this city of Luminopolis is on the same planet as one of the levels first seen in Tools of Destruction, but their vibes are totally distinct from one another thanks to this city's heavy blue tones and the fact that it's entirely powered by electric jellyfish slave labor. 
The rest of the game after this opening mission takes place entirely on planet Magnus, as after saving the city from the Zagroot, both that creature and our Quarktet are captured by a mysterious autonomous drone called Ephemeris. For about a century, this moon-sized drone has traveled throughout the universe, collecting at least one of every creature it can find on the different planets and moons it passes by. None of the inhabitants of Magnus know why Ephemeris has chosen their homeworld as its Pokemon box zoo enclosure thing, but Clank's got a new vacuum now, so that's pretty cool. Alright, so here's the thing about All for One, and it's gonna sound funny after I just spent like 20 minutes setting it up, I don't have much to say about this game. Welcome to the Golden Bolt, where we go deeper than anybody else really needs to. Alright, that's a bit uncalled for, you don't have to throw that in my face. There's still a bit I'm gonna say, of course, even if both this and the next spin-off are going to be shorter courses than you might be used to from me. The thing about both these games is that by design, they're either a measured departure from the Ratchet & Clank formula, or a fun twist on it. They're both shallower experiences compared to what we're used to, but I don't think that makes them necessarily less fun, and they're certainly not as bad as some folks like to let on. See, one of the things that this North Carolina team focused on while developing All for One was ensuring that all four players always had a direct impact on the gameplay. After exhaustive testing, they ran with the acronym CAKE. For every puzzle or set piece or fight, the goal to strive for was that it would be co-op, active for all players, kinetic, and easy to understand. Impressively, not only did they succeed, if not entirely, then at least for the most part, they succeeded across a full 8-9 to nine hour game in one of the longest Ratchet & Clank games out there. There are constantly fun teamwork bits like balancing on a taxi or a lifeboat to avoid hazards, or these weird hamster ball electric current things, or a short spaceship section that if you didn't know any better you'd think would be a prototype for lovers in a dangerous space time. In this game, they turned the idea of the Suck Cannon into a gadget instead of a weapon, a way to grab your pals and shoot them up to higher ground, across gaps, or off a cliff, your choice. The swing shot is now hilariously broken in the best way possible, as you grab onto the swing target and your buddies then grab onto your ass and hope they'll be able to fling themselves to safety. Falling into the abyss due to nothing more than weird jank could have been beyond frustrating, especially given that you only have four hit points, but thanks to the incredibly forgiving respawn system and your friends surrounding you, it just ends up causing the best kind of deep belly laughs. Perhaps the single best stamp of approval that I can give this game, though, is that despite its co-op nature, All For One features a surprisingly limited number of the usual obligatory bad turret sections that get lazily thrown into almost every co-op shooter, and at least in this one, you're on top of a gigantic, moving robot that fistfights his way through an army of other gargantuan robots to get you from point A to B as you shoot those robots to help out your giant robot buddy. Look, all I'm saying is this game kinda kicks ass in its own way, and I feel bad if you haven't seen the light yet. Thanks, Leon. And of course, the teamwork doesn't just end with the gadgets. This game's combat rewards you for communicating, and the weapons each have a bonus effect as more players use the same one, whether it's a faster rate of fire, an area of effect bonus, a stun effect, or a screen-clearing Sentai mech combination that'll kill pretty much everything except the final boss in a single hit, this game kicks some serious ass sometimes. Joining a bunch of returning PS3 era weapons that everybody started to get tired of already, like the Combustor Pistol, the Warmonger Rocket Launcher, or Mr. Zircon, there are some really neat new weapons that lean further into the chaos. Stuff like a gun that shoots clouds into the sky that then zap enemies nearby with lightning, or another lightning weapon that links up with your teammates and builds a giant moving grid of zappy zappy death death, or some deep cut classics like Walloper styled boxing gloves for four man fisting action, don't google that. Each of our four party members has a weapon unique to them as well that serves a more tactical purpose. Quirk has a bubble shield. Clank uses his Time God Zony powers for the only other time in the series after a crack in time. Great use of being a Time God, by the way. Ratchet's classic decoy weapons return, but this time they're packing heat, and Nefarious, like my dad, can turn invisible. Instead of upgrading your weapons in the traditional RNC way, though, the emphasis is now on bolts, and sort of on soft competing with your buddies to get the most money in each level. Whenever you get to a vendor, each player can use their bolts to either buy a new weapon or buy one of a few upgrades for one of their current weapons. This is obviously not nearly as thrilling as the classic experience system if you're playing alone, but given how you're sharing the baddies with your buddies and how you're already kind of competing for kills if you want to win the scoreboard at the end of each part of a chapter, it's an understandable attempt to simplify and focus on keeping players moving forward. I do kind of wish the game found a way to make this scoreboard stuff 
really matter at all, sort of like how the Little Big Planet games or later Mario 3D World did, just more of a physical manifestation of bragging rights so that if I win, my friends can decide to throw me off of a cliff for being too braggadocious. With a wide variety of enemies and combat encounters, and admittedly the occasional uninspired bubble of, hey, stop here and fight waves of enemies for a little bit, the game continues to look for ways to keep the combat evolving and engaging, and also sometimes those bubbles. But again, it's so impressive that All For One finds a way to succeed at a lot of this for a whole ass game. If anything, the game's length might be a detriment for some solely because it's sometimes difficult to get four friends to set aside three or four gaming sessions. I know for us, it took right around seven and a half hours across three separate days, and I can't help but feel that it would have been better received back in the day as a slightly shorter, cheaper game. That doesn't mean that it doesn't execute on those seven and a half hours remarkably well for this style of game. No, it puts a pure emphasis on that chaotic four-player shooty platformy sometimes puzzly action goodness that knows how to build on its ideas and new mechanics gradually without feeling too slow, that doesn't interfere too much with you or your friend's flow, that knows to shut up and let you joke around with your buddies while still knowing just the right times to inject some funny one-liners. Some of the series' best examples of physical comedy, this game is good at what it does, and what it does is get out of its own way. In fact, it being such a blast to play in co-op is part of why I'm not saying much about the finer details, because I was just enjoying myself when I was playing. There's not a ton to take notes on or analyze. You're only getting a few minutes of cutscenes at the bookends of chapters, and even then, the main plot isn't about our main cast. It's a background story about two dudes that's just meant to be the impetus for some fun little callbacks and a lot of the series surprisingly stronger jokes. I know I said it a moment ago, but again, it's just meant to be a fun game that stays out of its own way so your friends can have a good time. I think the problem comes with when All For One released and the platform it released on. I'm gonna upset everybody by reminding you of something you've long since forgotten about. 2011 was right thundersmack in the middle of the Online Pass era. Yeah, remember Online Passes? Even to this day, no update was ever pushed out to remove that $10 upcharge for those that bought the game physically, so any players that bought a used copy had to fork out an extra 10 bucks if they wanted to go online, and players that bought digitally or new either had to have family in the house that would play with them and up to four controllers to boot, or convince friends to come over and maybe bring their controllers, or convince those friends to also spend $60 on this game, or play with strangers via the matchmaking lobby system. Given that this was 2011, that it was a Ratchet & Clank game that looked very different with a far more exaggerated cartoony art style that was immediately associated with Kitty and therefore bad because gamers were weird about graphics there for a while, and that it was a full-priced game to boot, it didn't go super well. The other option, though, is a far, far worse one, playing alone. Despite its heavy emphasis on co-op, All For One is still playable solo by giving you a single, decently competent AI partner, usually Clank, although if you play as Clank, you get a shrinking quirk that jumps on your back. Neat. This is how my lonely ass played the game back when it first came out, and I remember feeling pretty mixed on it. It's... It's not a very good game to play alone. It's serviceable, I suppose, but the puzzles that felt remarkably involved, the battles that felt punchy and unique, and the surprising pacing when you've got four idiots on screen at once, it all feels subpar and empty without those friends. The humor lands less when you're mostly sitting in silence, the quips get a bit more annoying when the game feels like it tries to fill the dead air more often, and these sometimes hour-long levels don't feel rewarding enough when you're getting a couple minutes of story that you don't really care about without friends with whom you can riff on it. I had the fortune this time around of playing with my buddies Chris, aka Mykonos Fan, Brody, aka Rack Rocks, and Derek of Good Vibes Gaming, with the added bonus of doing it live on stream over at the latter's Twitch page, BitNerd Games. And the experience a decade ago versus today was absolutely day and night. For one, Rack Rocks was playing via the PlayStation Now streaming, pretty much flawlessly with the rest of us playing on PS3, although, to be fair, Derek did have to spend 10 bucks on that online pass because his code expired like 8 years ago. Get wrecked. Even when we had very infrequent hiccups, like when somebody dropped out, they could seamlessly drop back in like if we were playing locally right on the same couch. The fact that a short reloading screen is the only inconvenience to reconnecting is remarkable considering how limited this kind of co-op game was at the time, especially considering how limited this kind of co-op game was that actually did online right. Just about the worst sort of thing we had was the occasional visual drop-off, which I think was actually just on my end as the host. 
Now, it's not a great look to have what can appear to be frame drops or what ends up being perceived as a lesser art style in Insomniac's first 30 frame per second game besides all those other 30 FPS games none of you ever complained about, I'll admit, but given how much was going on on screen and under the hood to keep four players mostly seamless, I can kinda let it slide. I will say before I wrap up with All For One, as much as I say the story overall doesn't matter, and it really doesn't, it does sneak in some important moments that end up a bit undervalued in the larger picture. It's thanks to All For One that Ratchet realizes that Clank, as always, is right, and that they both do prefer the hero lifestyle to their constant attempts at retirement. It breaks Ratchet out of that funk. Ratchet's got a couple sweet moments with this little orphan girl. It's because he empathizes with her that he even agrees to help save Magnus to begin with, and it's through her that he sort of catches how much he's grown over time. Nefarious and Quirk aren't left in the dust either, they get ample time to shine, showcasing that, despite being a doofus, Quirk still does have that heroic heart in him, and that Nefarious actually has a heart at all. Plus, he bitch slaps a giant energy monster, which is just one of the best moments in the entire franchise. Clank is... he's a little bit larger now for this game, I guess. That's all he really... that's all he really gets. The A to B does not matter in the greater scope of the Ratchet universe, but I think after a string of overly self-important games that couldn't really reach their endpoint in the way Insomniac intended, a sort of bottle episode that doubles as a character piece was the right way to go, especially given this game's co-op yelling with your friend's nature. And I probably should have said this sooner because one of you's gonna make it weird, but no, I don't like All For One more than the other Ratchet games just because I chose not to write a novel this time and stuck with, yeah, it's alright. It was a treat to play this game with my buddies. In an era with games like Mario 3D World and Sackboy's Big Adventure, it's startling to see how well this co-op stuff tracks, even today. It's a fun enough game that I would even go back and play it a third time down the road. I mean, I wouldn't go back and play it solo, I didn't even play it solo for this retrospective, fuck that. It's probably fine enough two-player, but if you can't find a way to get at least three folks together, I really wouldn't bother. Three's actually maybe the Goldilocks scenario here, because with four players, it might just be a smidge too hectic at times, especially if you're playing as Clank, because he's still a tiny bit too small. Meanwhile, two players leaves a bit too much dead air in the room. That first part, by the way, is actually why I kind of prefer the original beta build's heads-up display to what we have in the final game. Having your health act as part of your drop shadow kind of helps center your focus a bit more, but it's not really a huge deal. As a Ratchet & Clank game, it's not great. It's probably the bottom of the list if I had to make a list, but that's also because the worst Ratchet game is like a C+, and the best ones realistically are like a B+, or an A-. This might be a shock coming from me, but a lot of people really overrate this entire series when it comes down to brass tacks, and that ratchet inflation, don't Google it, is part of what lets this game down. Players were, believe it or not, pretty okay with All For One at first. It was only later on that people started getting mad the game existed, and it definitely could have benefited from a cheaper price point looking back, but I don't get paid for hindsight. Well, wait, I guess I do. It still sold between 1 and 2 million copies in its lifetime, a pretty average number for the series by that point, especially considering the much lower budget and the absurd competition. All For One dropped the same day as Batman Arkham City, it came two weeks after Dark Souls, Battlefield 3 dropped a week after it, Uncharted 3 and Modern Warfare 3 were waiting in the wings, oh, and also Resistance 3 came out, I guess. Obviously, some of you are going to say those are all more mature games that don't necessarily compete, but that's the thing. These are the games that the early Ratchet audience was moving on to as they grew up. It's why the series continues to try and straddle the line between appealing to longtime fans and pulling in new fans from that original 7 to 10 year old target demo, because as most of us grow up, we're naturally going to start moving away from cartoony platformers for a few years, if not entirely. I truly do feel that if this were a game that popped up a little bit later around the PS4's launch, or perhaps a bit earlier so that it wasn't awkwardly sandwiched between Little Big Planet 2 at the start of 2011 and a bunch of games it had no ability to compete with at the end of that year, this game's perception would be far different. For a series that's the closest thing the blue brand has to Mario, experimentation made sense, especially after years of, let's face it, games that were mostly the exact same thing with a splash of new paint. The only noteworthy features added to the series after 2003 were competitive multiplayer, which was killed off after a couple games, co-op, which was killed off after one game, and a Kraken Times hoverboot gameplay six years and 92 games after Ratchet 2's big leap forward. 
After so much crunch, after burning out both developers and arguably players a bit with so many games, with a major restructure coming to the studio to ensure better development practices, and after a good spot to walk away narratively for at least a little while, this was, in my opinion, a great time to start playing around a bit with truly new ideas before the series' trademark gameplay went even more stagnant. Plus, again, it brought the co-op back, a common fan request, which only left things like competitive online and the hover boots on the shelf for now. Ah, fuck. Nah, jokes aside, here's the even hotter take than daring to say that All For One is pretty alright. I hope you're ready for this 7 million degrees Celsius of fire coming your way, this game is okay too. In fact, this is the point where I'm gonna start calling out some Ratchet & Clank fans on their bullshit, because this game exists as 100% fan service, and some of y'all treat it worse than the fucking mobile game. No, the other one. This, for those unaware, is Ratchet & Clank Full Frontal Assault, or Ratchet & Clank Q-Force in Europe, because as much as American fans whine about the game's titles getting sanitized over the years, it turns out it's hard to translate dumb innuendo into 8-plus languages. Produced by the same small crew as All For One, Full Frontal Assault exists only to do exactly three and a half things. One, it's a fun little bonus game to celebrate the series' 10th anniversary, alongside the HD remasters of the first four RNC games. Two, it allowed the team to play around some more with a crack in time's hoverboot gameplay, since this team didn't get to experience that in full until after All For One was in production. Three, appeased the portion of the fanbase that had been loudly begging for a new shot at RNC multiplayer in the style of Ratchet 3 or Deadlocked, and 3.5, the team thought it'd be fun to add some MOBA slash tower defense elements since they were probably all playing League or Dota 2's never-ending beta in their free time. I've been trying to find out for years now exactly how much production time this game had because it can't have been more than like a few months. I mean, just look at it. It's fine. It's, it's very fine. The All For One art style is translated back into the classic Ratchet control scheme, albeit stiffer, but unlike All For One, this one doesn't exactly sing the praises of 30 frames per second versus the 60 FPS cap that most of the earlier games had aimed for. It's not super well optimized, the locales, unlike All For One, are pretty bland, it's a very clearly quickly thrown together $20 game that certainly feels like it. Yeah, this game was 20 bucks. Actually, buying FFA came with a free download of Ratchet Deadlock's HD port, a $10 bonus to make up for the fact that this game's Vita version was delayed multiple times and is actual garbage. I don't know that that bonus still applies everywhere, but at least here in the US, it still does apply to all copies, even if you buy a used physical copy or a $10 digital one, which means that if you want the worst version of Deadlock at this point, it's actually free. Oh yeah, since I mentioned it, Insomniac pushed to get this game released on a disc worldwide solely because US fans were upset back in the day that Europe got a physical release for Quest for Booty when we didn't. I don't want to hear about how they don't care or that they're out of touch. That is bending over backwards to appease a handful of the most perennially upset gamers out there. Anyway, Full Frontal Assault, despite being a multiplayer-focused title, does have a short campaign, one that you can play co-op with a buddy locally or online. No online pass this time either, thank god. It's been three months since Captain Quirk lost the presidential election, and oh, oh god no, don't tell me. Computer, find me something to shoot! Sorry dude, we got not on the radar. Have an awesome day though! Whew, okay, you had me worried there. Dr. Nefarious is back to being missing, but you can pick between Ratchet, Clank, and no longer President Quirk as they defend a string of planets from a long-forgotten adversary, this fucking Redditor. This is Stuart Zergo, the Captain Quark superfan from back in Ratchet & Clank Going Commando. You wrote some really disturbing fanfiction. <laughs> like all superfans, Zergo eventually turned on the one he loved, deciding to ruin Quark by stealing the activation key to Quark's taxpayer-funded galactic weather grid and framing him for causing havoc across the galaxy. That is the entire story. I'm saving you a good bit of 2012 epic lead LOL gamerspeak humor, but that is the entire story otherwise. You can thank me later for saving you that cringe. Those jokes are certainly a far leap from the days of over-consumerism commentaries, but I'll tell you what, if you're looking to fill that PS2-era cynical capitalism void in your heart, I, I don't know, buy a Golden Bolt mug or hat or something. It pr probably won't bring back the old days, but it's a really nice mug, it holds a lot of tears. Zergo's lines were more than a bit cringy back then, and definitely more so now. He also does the Gognum style dance. Yeah, 2012. Generally, FFA is a mostly harmless callback to a bunch of the classic games, between Zergo, this game's hub area being the Starship Phoenix 2, or even the ship's AI being voiced by Mikey Kelly, the original voice of Ratchet. And putting aside the story, which is fewer than 10 minutes of cutscenes anyway, the gameplay I actually think is pretty inspired. 
with the caveat that it's inspired as much by other things as it is new ideas. Like I said earlier, the main vehicle to drive FFA's level design is the returning hover boots from A Crack in Time, with every one of the game's whopping three main levels being these big sort of open battlefield affairs. The two key twists on the usual Ratchet style here are that you don't buy weapons, you find them, and that enemies aren't just these stationary things anymore like they've always been. In this game, enemies will occasionally make a beeline to assault your base of operations, and it's up to you to defend it in between completing your main objectives. As you explore these levels, you'll find a bunch of little care packages dropped off, and usually surrounded by enemies. When you pop one of these bad boys open, you'll get to pick from a selection of weapons that you'll then have for the duration of the level. Weapons are back to leveling in the classic Ratchet & Clank fashion, but you'll sort of be asked here to choose between different weapons at times, rather than being able to get the whole arsenal in each and every level. In fact, there's only a single power weapon drop in each of the levels, forcing you to choose between the rocket launcher or the bomb launcher depending on your personal taste or depending on what enemies you think you might have. Have in store. Between searching for and completing objectives, gearing up on weapons, searching for gold bolts, and just taking your time zooming around on your hover boots, it's a surprisingly fun time, especially with a buddy as you both split off to different objectives. I wouldn't say these levels are particularly memorable in the grand scheme of the series, but they each stick out from one another with some fun design, and this hidden jungle city even returns as a fairly unique tundra in level 4 when the angry hollow game nerd fires up the weather grid. But you can't just focus on your objective, because like I said, every now and then enemies will bum rush your base, forcing you to race back and protect your generators. In Full Frontal Assault, your bolts will go to buying defenses for your base's two attack lanes, in the form of shields, mines, and turrets based on the series' iconic weapons. If you only played the campaign, you would think that it's a decent 2-3 hour ratchet game with some tedious tower defense elements, and not much else. Which sort of makes sense, I would be surprised if this campaign wasn't an obligatory thing, that's not why this game was made. No, Full Frontal's meat and potatoes are at least intended to be its 1v1 or 2v2 online multiplayer modes, which attempt a more modernized version of the Ratchet 3 and Deadlocked multiplayer. Here, the game is split into three rounds that cycle a few times before going into a sudden death phase. First up is the recon phase, where, like in the old games, both teams attempt to capture as many of these little bases sprinkled around the map as possible, called nodes. These start out as neutrally defended bases, and then once captured will be defended by allied guards and turrets, and you can spend some bolts to add further defenses against the enemy team. You'll earn a constant stream of money for every node you're currently holding, and once per captured node, you'll be able to pick a weapon to add it to your arsenal, sort of like in the campaign. This brings in a fair bit of unique strategy. If you know you've held node 1 the entire game and the enemy team keeps trying to go for it to get that extra weapon, you can stack the defenses there if you have the money, or sit there and get into a shootout yourself. Outside of the recon phase, you can't capture nodes, although you can finish capturing one if you started that little Gears of War reload minigame in the final clutch seconds of the round. Next up is the squad phase, which is where this game's clear MOBA inspiration starts to show itself, as in addition to purchasing defenses like in the campaign, you can also spend your bolts sending different types of minions down one or both of the lanes to the enemy base. There aren't more than a few enemy types, so it's not really incredibly deep, but you can set some fun traps, like having your teammates scout their base to see what defenses they're building from afar so that you can target whichever lane looks weaker, or you can set all your bots to rush one lane while you push another. Later in the match, this has a good chance of becoming a war of attrition between several massive tanks and well-placed defenses, which is why having as many nodes as possible is critical as the match progresses. Which brings us to Phase 3, the All Out Assault. Do you decide to rush the enemy base to destroy their six generators as fast as possible, or do you stay back to defend your base and hope your bots overwhelm them? There's a thick enough layer of strategy in this loop that in the right hands, matches can end up deadlocked. But it's also simple enough that if you know what you're doing, you can completely shatter the game balance. For example, jumping around like an idiot with the flamethrower works every time. Once per game, each team can hit a panic button inside their base to warp out the enemy players for the duration of the round at least, and the game did actually see a number of patches to try and fine-tune the balance. In fact, Insomniac even added two extra multiplayer maps for free, and a roundless pure chaos mode on top of a bunch of fun DLC skins if you ever felt the urge to drop a couple bucks to play as Drek or Chainblade. Chainblade! Chainblade! I only put a little bit of time into the online back when it first came out, but coming back to it with some of my buddies, yet again I was pleasantly surprised by how much fun we were having. 
There was a good amount of back and forth in the first couple matches. The game worked pretty remarkably even though one of us was playing via PlayStation Now, over Wi-Fi, and naturally had some latency issues. It still found a way to be a fun, engaging struggle despite that. It was such a pleasant surprise that I kinda wanna come back to it down the road, both with my pals and who knows, maybe one day I'll do a couple streams over on my Twitch where I set up a lobby and we just mess around and see what happens. It's absolutely not without flaws. Because it's only a four-player game at most, one person not pulling their weight or lagging has a good chance of tanking an entire match, and like any game with any semblance of strategy involved, you would have to be ready for a Zerg rush from your opponent if you ever tried matchmaking. I guess it'd be a Zergo rush in this game, huh? But for a quick bonus anniversary game made in what had to be only a few months, it was fun. I'm still sometimes baffled at how much of a bad rap FFA got, but I guess coming off of the back of one spinoff with another spinoff, even with good intentions, it's not going to be a great look, doubly so since the HD collection already annoyed people due to its hiccups. Like I've said, all that crunch catches up to you eventually, whether it's before release or a decade later when somebody has to reverse engineer all the messy work your team did when they couldn't sleep. And speaking of, I guess I do have to spend a moment on the twice-delayed Vita port, which, I have to say, might be the actual worst-performing game on the PlayStation Vita. I'm not gonna show you footage of that version. It ran so poorly and genuinely hurt my eyes too much on an actual tiny Vita screen for me to even consider blowing that up onto a larger screen, both for my sake and yours. You can find clips online, it's rough, and this is after the outsourced port team cut out the 2v2 multiplayer and made huge concessions to even get it running at the sub 20 frames per second it does. And this came out six months late. I would not be surprised if the port took longer to finish than the original. Let's just say it's pretty clear why Sony gave away Deadlocked HD, because even Insomniac's community team got snippy at points defending themselves against fans angry about a port that Insomniac had no say in. Between that and the next Ratchet Games production, starting by the time Full Frontal Assault had finally hit the Vita, I wouldn't be surprised if the disastrous timing is why the final two DLC skin packs never came out. When I look at these two games, and even the comic, I see a company clearly at a crossroads. I see some well-intended experimental projects that maybe ended up hurting more than they helped, certainly to a chunk of fans. But I just don't feel that these games deserved all the vitriol, especially as the years have gone on. Players dissected the new art style, Insomniac's new engine optimizing for 30 frames per second because their data showed that most folks don't care about the difference between an easy-to-make 30 FPS and sleeping at work to get an unstable 60. Even the new composer's more orchestrated, less electronic soundtracks weren't safe because once a few folks had the narrative that these games were different and therefore bad, nothing was safe. It rapidly spiraled into bitter assertions that the developers didn't know what they were doing, these asinine assertions that feel like they've popped up more and more with every Ratchet game since. Where A Crack in Time was the game that finally broke the developers, these were the games that broke the fanbase. And that's a shame. Not because you should love these games or anything, I don't care. More because as the years have rolled on and the series has sort of moved on, a lot of folks have felt left behind and turned cynical or even salty because they didn't get the crack in time too they wanted. And to some extent, I get it, especially since we didn't know how monumental that game's production was for the studio in the worst way possible, or how the quote-unquote Ratchet team was actually working mostly on Resistance 3 already, or the EA game that was waiting in the wings, or that Sony was already looking to expand the series into film, hence the big multimedia push, action figures, comics, a co-op family-friendly game to try and grow the audience behind about a million kids and a million more older kids that were growing up and hadn't yet realized that they could grow out of liking certain things. You Want to hear some shit? I can guarantee that maybe two of you, two single people of those of you watching this video, know that Resistance 3's directors had pitched Sunset Overdrive to the rest of the studio by the time All For One came out. They were mere weeks away from pitching that game to Microsoft. Yeah, there was a lot going on at that point, and much of it was a response to burning out of the two alternating series that were supposed to sustain this studio for years to come. But now we do know all these things, and I think it's time to reassess our perception of it, just as we've done with the other games before. If not for these two games, made by a team that wanted to see the series continue and experimented to try and make that happen, the recent trend of several year gaps between Ratchet and Clank games probably starts a lot sooner. And hey, to some of you, that's possibly better off. That's totally cool. Across this entire retrospective series, though, I've looked at these games both on their own merits, but also within the context of their surroundings, and I like to look at the goals the team had in mind with each one to see if the team succeeded. 
To me, although the spin-off era didn't exactly succeed commercially, it achieved its goals, in part to be fair because the team set a lower bar so they wouldn't kill themselves doing it. The studio finally got to make the larger references to the PS2 era and classic characters and levels, just like both they and the fans had wanted for years. All for One addressed the common co-op requests, and Full Frontal Assault took that further by finally granting the wish of the five or six fans that wanted a new competitive mode, while also pivoting right back to the beat-to-death classic Ratchet & Clank gameplay as if to say, hey, look, All for One was just a new idea, Ratchet's not going anywhere, don't worry. And although from any objective measurement these are two of the weakest games in the franchise due to their experimental nature, I think change should be welcomed in a series that struggled to do so across practically every other mainline game, because that change means that the people behind it actually had the time to make changes. I think it absolutely should still be constructively critiqued so that iterations and improvements can come from that discussion, but not eviscerated because some folks want it done the same old way as the last seven games. However, ten years on, we know that this style of RNC simply isn't coming back, so I'm not going to waste my breath or your time by punching down on a couple games that are often just kinda there, but still end up being more fun than many would like to admit. There have got to be some other folks out there that you can find for that sort of video, I'm sure, but that's not what I do here. Every era of Ratchet & Clank brings on new minds that add their own flavor to the games, that bring in a unique vision and new ideas. At this point, a lot of these new minds are lifelong fans because this series is 20 this year. If that new blood was finally starting to get the time to test and execute new ideas, that's cause for celebration, not condemnation. I'm going to say this loud and clear for the ones in the back. It's never going back to how it was before when a bunch of kids right out of college pushed themselves too hard to prove themselves in an industry that does not care about people. And that change is a great thing, even if these games that came from it may not have been right away. Even if we might miss some of the more cynical humor that was almost certainly brought on by everybody being so exhausted. You can take them however you want, I'm not going to tell you how to feel, but for me, I'll choose to look at them pleasantly surprised that this spin-off era kind of holds up better looking back now than it did back in its era. Thank you so much for watching, especially if you made it this far. If you didn't, how are you here? Make sure to double check that you're subscribed so that YouTube doesn't hit me again. Seriously, only about a quarter of viewers on YouTube are ever subscribed to anybody. It's wild. And of course, please let me know your thoughts on this spin-off era of RNC. I also want to give a massive thanks, as always, to my Patreon supporters for being the coolest people around, including this increasingly long list of folks whose names I'm going to try and read out in one breath. Goldstorm07, Anon42, Karagani564, Lightning Gianni, Philly D360, Phyrexian Sleeper Agent, Rodney220, The FOE3, Vincent, Cooking Mama, Eclipse2025, Even Luck, Faisal B, Harry Baker, Heidi, Hotsi, Ibithon, James Boss, Justin Gregoire, Lit Links, Lupine Pariah, Philip, Shadow Nexa, Debris Sadiq, Terminally Nerdy, The Milkman, and Buckles Chuck Lowe. Whew, got it at the very last second there. If you want to join these folks, gain access to the Golden Bolt Discord server, and many more perks, you can do so for as little as a dollar a month at patreon.com slash thegoldenbolt. I'll see you folks again soon, but until then, as always, stay golden.